Hello everyone, welcome back to Speaking Spurs with me Kieran talking all things Tottenham. So we're jumping into once again all the news from today to do with Tottenham. Um, if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the channel, like the video and place your comments below so we can get the conversation going. But before we move on to the Tottenham stuff, there's just a quick mention for the new mega rich club within the Premier League, Newcastle United, who are going to use this opportunity to put themselves back up near the top of the Premier League where their fans will feel they rightfully belong. Like Newcastle, once upon a time, were a great club. They got an incredible fan base, which is probably why the owners have picked Newcastle um, rather than some of the other clubs. Newcastle come rain or shine. They've got a great, great fan base, lots of noise, very, very passionate place, Newcastle, um, for football. So it, Chelsea had their time. Man City have wiped and cleaned up for a while. Now it's time for Newcastle to put themselves back in that place. Expect word to spread around the world of all the money-grabbing players galore. So I would expect them to start picking up bigger-name players and work their way back up the table. But now that's aside, let's jump into the importance of this channel, and that is all things Tottenham Hotspur. So we're just talking about stories that have come out today, and let's start with a bit of homegrown. Um, we've had some homegrown stories over the last few days. We spoke about Harry Winks, we've spoken about Troy Parrott. Now it's time to talk about Oliver Skip, who, in my opinion, has been an absolute revelation, and that is massive, massive thanks to Norwich for helping him develop uh, really into the next stage of his career and push him on. Great, great season for them where he managed to gain promotion. They would have loved to have had him back. Uh, that wasn't possible because, you know, he proved his worth and we decided we want to keep him. And that's exactly what he's doing this season, proving his worth. And it was obvious in the games that he didn't play just how much we missed him. And Nuno's obviously realised that and brought him back into the squad. And he's doing fantastically well. So this story is about um, Lee Carlsley. So for those of you that don't know, he's the England under-21 boss. He's come out and labelled Skip as underrated. He's insisted that he's going to get better and better with time. He said he's one of those players when he's not in the team, you notice him. He goes about his business well. Uh, he works on his game. He will get better. He will get stronger. He has outstanding ability. Uh, he also insisted that it's not out of the question for Skip to make the squad for next year's World Cup. Wow. I mean, that is that is a big statement to make. Look, Realistically, is he going to make the squad? Um, probably not. Will he get a cap in that time, uh, in the build-up to the World Cup? There's a good chance he might get put into a squad. Might not make it into the team, but he might be in and around training. Um, especially with recommendations coming up from Lee Colesley, Gareth Southgate. Might choose to select him in a squad. He's not. He hasn't like shied away from putting youngsters within the squad. And they quite often repay him the favour and do very well. Also, on the Oliver Skip thing... Obviously, we're impressed with him at Spurs. The coaches absolutely love him. He's a model professional, does very well, um, goes about his business the right way. Uh, they apparently are looking to tie him down to a new contract, and rightly so. The guy deserves you know, a little bit more money within the squad. I think he's proven himself nicely. And on top of that, to tie him down to a longer contract would be fantastic at this stage. So very excited about that. Um, talking about a former Spur. So we spoke about a former one yesterday in Sandro. Now we're talking about a more recent former Spur in Serge Aurier. You know, the guy that uh, split a lot of opinions, uh, had some absolute howlers at times, did some great things, you know, was in our Champions League final squad, was in the Carabao Cup final squad. So he's had his fair share of uh, decent times with Spurs as well as bad times. Now he's cleared up those claims that he was thinking about joining Arsenal. I have no doubt Arsenal were probably looking at him as an option, you know, a guy of his talent on a free, why not take the risk? Especially with their leaky defence the way it was. So he's come out and said some wonderful things about the Spurs fans in his time at Spurs, but we'll just skip to the, the important bit for us. I have never seen myself at another club in England, if not at your place. And I didn't see myself joining the enemy even less because I have too much respect for our club, for our history and for all our moments shared together. So what I like about that is not just the fact that he's called Arsenal the enemy. He hasn't even referred to their name, which is fantastic because, you know, goon has come. So he hasn't even referred to the name whatsoever. He's called them the enemy, which I absolutely love. And then on top of that, he's not said your club, your history, and all the moments we shared together is our club, our history. So even though he's not at the club anymore... 
very much sees himself as part of the Spurs family, which is fantastic. Like he's moved on, no animosity whatsoever. Uh, I wish him all the best. I'm sure he did very well in La Liga, but it's just nice to see him come out and make those comments. Um, there's probably a bit of PR in there from his his team saying, "Look, you need to redeem yourself back in the eyes of, of uh, the Tottenham fans." Um, because he's been silent really since he's left. But like, let's put it this way. I've spoken about it before. I'll say it again. He was very much loved around the ground, an absolute joker, um, a joy for people to be around when you're on the right side of him. He's had a bit of a shaky past at times, but look, there is no doubt about it. He is was, was an absolute blast by the sounds of it around the ground. I've got a friend that works for Spurs and he said like, Aurier is an absolute prankster, funny guy, really nice. So, you know, I wish him all the best. Uh, next one. Um, yeah, we'll go into we'll go into the international story now about the Argentinian lads. So uh, Lionel Scaloni, um, Argentinian manager, has spoken and he's come out and said the players will be there for all three games for Argentina, and under no circumstances will they leave earlier. Um, you know, it's it's one of them things. It's really bad for us because it means there's more time uh, for Romero to not be playing, and especially La Celso. And I feel sorry for him because it's great that he's doing really well in the Argentina squad and they want him around. Problem is, it's hindering his Spurs career because every time he starts turning things around and hits a good bit of form, bang, he either gets injured, bang, he's on international duty. They're just little setbacks all the time for other people to come in, take the place, um, have a couple of good games and then he comes in and gets like small amounts of minutes but he's always trying to recapture that match fitness for us um, and gelling with the players around him so yeah great on on one level crappy on another and like, I think this whole situation is bad for football really I can understand these international managers not wanting to release the players especially when they're playing things like World Cup qualifiers the last thing you want is to not select players um, or let them go home early back to their respective leagues, like the Premier League, so they haven't got to isolate um, for... Well, they have got to isolate, but you know what I mean? So they're actually back in time for the Premier League clashes. You know, what if he lets Romero and Lo Celso go? They have a really bad game. They end up not qualifying for a World Cup. That's Scaloni's job gone. So I understand from a managerial perspective, exactly why they want them around. They have to be selfish. It's their job. It's their nation. It's their passion. Um, as for the players as well, it's... You know, national pride. They want to play for their country, so I get it. But it's bad for football at the same time because you're just tugging on people's heartstrings and you're, you're forcing them to make decisions they don't want to make. They're getting fined by their clubs and all sorts like that. I mean, our South American guys were fined by the club last time because the clubs really wanted to stamp their feet down and be like, look, you're our player first, you're their player second because you're not contracted to your country, essentially. Um, and the reason it's bad for football is because the international governing bodies just need to realise that we're still in a pandemic. Stop organising all these games and throwing them around. Find neutral territories where these players can go and play. It doesn't have to be on home turf, just neutral grounds where they can all go to and they can isolate together. Um, so we haven't got to keep sending them to these intermittent countries to, to isolate and stuff. It's just an absolute shambles and a waste of time by the governing bodies of football. Um, moving on to the next international story. So Brian Hill has been playing for Spain, came off the bench with 18 minutes to go against Italy, where they managed a 2-1 victory. In that time, he managed to have two shots, two crosses, an 86.7% passing accuracy and 23 touches of the ball. It's his fourth cap for Spain. Um, and do you know what? A lot of people watched it. I've, I've seen clips of it and I thought for the time he was given absolutely insane he did ridiculously well he fits into that Spanish style of football um, he's been putting in decent performances for Spurs growing and growing as time goes on so he's definitely one to watch and in that short space of time he managed to give a very passionate and, and energetic performance and may that continue with Spurs and I expect big things from him in the future now coming away from the international scene but we will be talking about international players so with regards to strikers, I'll talk about Dusan Vlahovic first. So I mentioned him the other day. Now, there's a lot of stuff in the press saying that talks have been ramping up. Paratici, they're saying, is in, in talks with his people. Um, they suspect that they are you know, talking between agents uh, for the 21-year-old and they're well underway and expect him to cost a pretty penny, obviously. He's still got time left on his contract till 2023. Fiorentina, they don't want to let him go. But if they are going to let him go, they would prefer that he moved out 
of Italy. They don't want to come up against him, obviously. Kind of with the Harry Kane situation that we had, Daniel Levy said he would rather sell, you know, to elsewhere in Europe rather than him stay in the Premier League and have to play against us. And it's the same sort of situation for them. They don't want it to happen. So there is a good chance that we could get him. Uh, a lot of that's going to depend on Manchester City and whether they come into him, come in for him or not. But I wouldn't be surprised if Paratici is already in there trying to make things happen. Expect a pre-agreement to come. There's even a chance he could come across in January. Who knows? We'll see how things go. But now we'll talk about backups to that. So... And this is, this is going to be the big bulk. This will be the last... No, it won't be. I've actually got a couple more bits after that. But anyway, yeah. Um, backup striker to Vlahovic. A backup idea. Prolific Nigerian striker, Umar Sadiq, is now apparently a target. So a lot of you may not, not know anything about him. He's had some time in top flight before. So following his performances for Almeria in the Spanish Segunda, so that's the second division in Spain, um, many of Europe's biggest clubs are looking at him. He's 24 years old. He has scored 20 goals and has seven assists from last season, which almost helped Almeria gain promotion back to La Liga. Um, this season, he already has six goals and three assists in his eight appearances. There's a 30 million euro valuation on his head at the moment. So, I mean, that's not crazy money at all. I know you might think that's a lot of money for a Segunda division player, but trust me, he is not a Segunda, Segunda division player. Like he deserves to be in a top league at the end of the day. So he actually um, has moved a lot on loan in his career. So we'll talk about his, his career. Youth career, he started at Kusa Boys, then Future of Africa, and then on to Abuja. His senior career, he was at Spezia, then went on loan to... Lavanese, then on Rome, on Rome, on loan to Roma. Roma then decided to sign him. Um, didn't really make waves there at all, if I'm honest. They sent him on loan to uh, Bologna, then Torino, then NAC Breda, Rangers, Perugia, Partizan, who he then signed for permanently, and then signed for Almeria. Um, He's got some good strengths, so we'll talk about them. Through balls, uh, holding on to the ball, his dribbling, his defensive ability is good from the attack as well. Um, problems, uh, he tends to stray offside a lot, which is a hell of a frustration. I, I can't stand it when people stray offside. How hard is it to stand a couple of yards back from the defenders? Because the momentum's going your way if a ball's played through. You're on the front foot to run through. They have to backpedal first. So for me, offsides, there should never, ever be them. Um, his style of play uh, he's a threat from indirect set pieces so we're talking about when he's the man in the box getting on the end of crosses uh, very good on the counter attack he gets fouled very often you know winning free, free kicks in dangerous areas loves to dribble with the ball um, very good at his short passing the only issue is a uh, typical striker not very good at tackling but he obviously goes in for the tackle a lot commits a lot of fouls but then on the flip side that doesn't bother me too much because it means he's breaking up attacks before they happen. You know, he's defending from the front. And that's something we've been missing recently. Like, Kane used to press high quite a lot. It's something that we've definitely been missing. So, look, he looks like a good prospect if the Vlahovic deal doesn't work. Um, he's got a lot of experience, as you can see. He's been around a lot of places. So, yeah, we'll see what happens there. And then moving on to the last few bits that I've got here. Um, you may have seen that the Tottenham Hotspur Supporters Trust wanted to meet the Tottenham board to hash things out after our bad sport, bad sport, bad start to the season. So they have refused to meet the Supporters Trust after the mixed start where we had, what, three wins, uh, one nil. Quite tight, not great, um, other than the City win. Then we obviously had the three very poor defeats where we conceded three goals in each of them, all to London teams. Um, but we have, you know, we've won two since then, which will help build a little bit of confidence. We're actually not in a bad position in the league. So I'm not surprised that they've actually refused to meet them at this moment in time. So they wanted to meet them because of the mixed start. It's led to questions over the focus of the board, its objectives and how it measures progress. Look, I get it. I understand. Daniel Levy put his statement out at the end of the season saying he wanted to get back to the Tottenham way of playing, you know, the attacking flair, 
um, and sort of, you know, what's in our DNA, as he kept saying. However, you know, things have gone the way they have. We've got Nuno in charge, who was a little bit more pragmatic than we wanted, but Paratici was brought in. He just, he decided we needed somebody that's not just going to go out all out attack. You know, with the team we got, we go out all out attack without having some sort of defensive strategy. And I can just see us getting beaten a lot. We essentially become a Leeds United, which yes, is exciting, but I don't want to get hammered in certain games. We've seen what's happened to them when they get torn apart by the likes of Manchester United. It's not great. Although it's not the most attractive style of football that we play at the moment, I feel like we can get there and I feel like Nuno wants to build it slowly and get it right. So, yeah, you know, there's things where I feel sorry for Nuno. He's not been in for a long time whatsoever. The Harry Kane situation definitely didn't help settle the... Sorry, pardon me. Settle the squad or Harry Kane himself. And Nuno is being questioned on it a lot, probably without the reassurances of what was definitely going to happen. Um... Obviously, he didn't get all his targets in the window because that's just the way it is at Spurs. Paratici obviously was heavily involved in making decisions on those. Um, so, yeah, he's been here a short time. He's got new players that were brought in that he's got to integrate into the squad. We've had the international break that didn't help where we have three players isolating, five players injured. We've still got players injured now. Um, ben Davies is the latest person to, to not be uh, playing internationally at the moment. He's had to drop out of the squad. So look, he's had a lot to deal with. And this is why I think the, the supporters trust need to kind of wind their necks in just a little bit. Give it some more time. We've barely played any games this season, if I'm honest. Um, if when all the players are back fit and it's not working, then have talks. I feel like you kind of have to leave it till January. We're not in the worst state ever. We've just had two positive performances, which shows there's an element that it can be turned around. And some of the guys that were playing poorly have started playing better. So you've got to give it some time. Um, and then lastly, because I don't want to end on that negative, although this isn't the most positive story in the world. So Emerson Royale, we know he's come in. He played much better in the last game. I thought he did some really good things. He's got a long way to go until he's at the standard we want him to be at. And he'll know that himself. Nuno knows that. He's come out and said it as well, that you know he he can still be better. And we'll all, we'll all know that. He's not settled yet. At the end of the day, he doesn't speak the language. And this is what he's been talking about. He's come out, had an interview and said, you know, he's struggling a bit to settle into life in England. Um, for a start, the weather, he's mentioned it's, it's a lot colder. Although we're not at our coldest yet, our weather is up and down like a yo-yo. I feel sorry for anyone that comes over here from another country having to settle in. So the weather, the the lack of language, he said that he's finding it quite hard, but he's promised that he's going to study to get there. Um, obviously, he's played with La Celso before, which is probably helping him settle in. Uh, he was saying that when he was playing in Spain, it was a bit easier because, you know, he obviously speaks Portuguese, being a Brazilian lad. Um, there's certain elements you can pick up. There's there's similar um, wording. So you'll know roughly what they're on about. Here, it's completely different language because we're awkward as English. That's what we do. We make everything as difficult as we can for everybody else. Hey, come on, you Spurs. Um so, yeah, he's found it difficult. He doesn't really understand what many of them are asking for. He said he's picking up little bits, not at the rate that he would want, but he's going to work hard and get there. And I really hope he does. And he's got Lucas Moura there to help him as well. Um, you know, the other French lads before, they helped Undombele settle in because his English was was terrible. Uh, Sissoko really, really took him under his wing and helped him. Um, and now I'm assuming Moura is going to do the same with, with Emerson Royale. So I'm excited to see what comes from him. He definitely looks a good prospect. Much better than what we've we've had previously in terms of uh, Doherty and Aurier. I don't think Emerson's going to be as, shall we say, accident prone on the pitch in the defensive capacity. And he looks like he's good at getting forward. He's got decent pace about him. He's, he's strong. He's had a tough start so far. He's come up against some difficult wingers, but it all looks good. Um you know, we'll give the players time. We'll give Nuno time because we have to. It's just, it's the start of a fresh project. Like Nuno's not the most experienced manager we could have gone for. So you can give him time. Whereas with Mourinho, we kind of just expected it at the end of the day. The guy's a natural born winner. It should have clicked. Uh, Levy should have backed him. Uh, and I feel like, you know, we're on a journey and let's just enjoy it. Although I'm sure Spurs will make it very difficult to us to enjoy it as time goes on. But, you know, that's that's it today. We'll stick to that. Um, so starting with a positive with Oliver Skip, finishing with a kind of positive in the terms of Emerson Royale and the fact that he started to play better with a little glimpse in there about Brian Hill because we're loving the guy at the moment. 
So thanks for sticking around, guys. Um, as I said before, if you haven't done so and you're a regular watcher, please subscribe to the channel and support in any way you can. Uh, don't forget to like and put your comments below. And I will talk to you tomorrow with hopefully some more exciting stories. No doubt more transfer links because that's what we do here. So thanks for sticking around, guys. Enjoy your evening. Take care. And as always, come on, you Spurs. How many of you say that along with me? Let me know in the comments. See you later, guys.